Hi, how y'all doing? Good. Uh, my name is Forrest Sprague. I am a partner at a civic tech company here in Chicago called Datamain. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be back here because I'm talking about a project uh, that my business partner Derek Gator and I presented at uh, GP in 2012. So the project has uh, developed in the intervening six years. So it's a, it's a, nice, it's a nice time to check in. So we're talking today about um, an open source library that we've been working on called Dedupe that does fuzzy matching, deduplication, and record linkage uh, using machine learning. So just to set the stage, um, uh, if you work with uh, data that wasn't collected by sensors or it's like at some point it involved people actually entering in data by hand at any point, then the data is messed up. Um, uh, it's got misspellings, it got, doesn't have unique identifiers, and uh, uh, people, have, you know, people move, they change their addresses, they change their phone numbers, sometimes people, try, people have nicknames. Um, uh, data is terrible. And so uh, DDoP is, is a software that tries to deal with one particular way that they're terrible, which is tries to find um, uh, references all the times that a particular set of data is actually about the same entity. Um, so yeah, names can be just spelled every, the same, the same person can have so many different names. And even if you, the name is, uh, um, even if the name is spelled correctly at every time, like a name is just a pointer, right? A name is just uh, a reference to something else. And the same string can, referred is not the data, right? So like, uh, is not the thing. And um, so the problem of, of trying to make, uh, of trying to make references in a data set, like really refer to the same thing is, um, is hard. And particularly when you forget that there's actually this gap between the data and the, and the entity or person that you're talking about. So there's a lot of John Smiths. Um, we actually got started on this problem because we were interested in campaign finance. Um, we wanted to just ask some basic questions. Who gave the most money to, uh, like within a political cycle? Who gives money to whom? Um, those are questions that, just that first question, like who is the largest donor in Illinois in like let's say the, uh, the 2018 <coughs> governor's race? That question right now is kind of, is now much more answerable because of Dedu, but when we started working on this project, it was basically unanswerable because um, there was uh, the Associated General Contractors of America, there's the Georgia Branch Associated General Contractors of America, there's the jo Georgia Associated General Contractors PAC, there was Georgia Branch Associated Gen Cond, and like, oh, those are all the same entity, but, uh, uh, there's not, that's not the kind of thing that you can just do a, a group by. So, um, before we started working on this program, we did what I think a lot of folks do when they start to deal with this data is, is that we wrote a lot of regular expressions, we wrote a lot of rules, we said like, okay, well, you know, if you lowercase everything and you remove any punctuation and um, you split on this thing and you ignore this thing, are they the same? Uh, and that actually works totally fine for um, a single data set that's probably maybe up into the low tens of thousands of records uh, once. And then you have to do it all over for a whole data set or if you get more data then all the rules that you wrote no longer work. And you have to write more terrible rules and it takes forever and it's no fun and the program has no value beyond that one single task. And so uh, I saw there was a yak here that needed to be shaved and we've been shaving it for six years. So um, basically what we're going to be doing is going to be doing, trying to solve three problems. One is trying to get computers to do something something along the lines of what we do when we see names and addresses and product names or reference names of any sort and are able to say like, well, those are probably the same thing. Like how, uh, uh, 
then the second thing is it says that we're going to try to get the computer to take different pieces of evidence, like the name are similar, but the addresses are maybe not similar, and try to decide, well, how to weight those different pieces of information. And then third, and actually kind of the trickiest in this area, is we're going to try to do this for large data sets. Large here is, um, right now, our horizon of really the kind of practical data sets that we can handle is probably 60, 70 million, 70 million rows. Um, if you're doing record linkage, you can do more, but if you're deduplicating a single set, that's kind of practically the largest that we've done. And we have some ideas, I think, that are pretty exciting. I think it could get us another 10x, and then I think you need a radically different approach. So um, there's basically three ways to do this first problem, some of which you might have seen before. Um, one is to say, like, two names are, are likely to be the same, uh, about the same thing if this characters of the sequence of the characters of the string are similar. So these are often called string distances. The most famous is called the Hamming distance or the Levenstein distance, depending upon who you think is more famous. Um, and it's really good for misspellings and typos and abbreviations. Um, so it's great for Steven and Steve and Steve, like it'll do pretty well. Those are some similar sequences of, um, of characters, um, but it does terrible for the Steve and Stove. Like Steve and Stove have no real semantic relation to each other, but they're very similar strings. So the other idea that floats around is kind of set similarity. So you think about this works more famous, more commonly used for larger documents. Um, you, you kind of split everything into tokens or to parts of words, and then you say that if two documents are tend to have the same words in them, then they're likely to be about the same thing. Um, so Jeff Yergard Sessions and Jeff Sessions are really very far away if we're comparing a sequence of characters, but they have a they have uh, this word in common, so they might score pretty high in this way. Um, it's not really good if you have short documents, and it's typically uh, terrible if you have misspellings. It's like this kind of approach is really uh, particular on, um, on being able to exactly match the tokens. Um, this is uh, this is the technique that was used in the first generation of internet search engines. So AltaVista type engines were using um, a kind of index like this, famously TF-IDF. Actually, if you ever use Solar or Elasticsearch or some of these kind of um, applications that do, uh, that add search engines to your uh, application, they're also using this kind of similarity. Um, more, it's an older idea, but this is probably the most popular. Uh, well, not be popular, the hottest idea right now is kind of semantic similarity, which says if like two words, two names are likely to be similar if they tend to appear in the same context. Like so, you take a large group, a large set of documents, and you look at kind of a window for each word, and then you see if the same word, if words tend to be surrounded by the same set of neighbors, then maybe they're, they're substitutable. So um, versions of this idea have been around for a long time, but this is kind of what neural networks are doing with things like word effect um, and to some extent, the LSTM um, models. So this is actually doing really pretty well if you have an enormous corpus. Um, it's also, it can do things the other the two couldn't, like it could work on something like Peggy and Margaret, because Peggy is a nickname for Margaret, but they have no similarity at the kind of letter level. Um, it requires a lot of training data that typically you don't have. We use uh, actually all three of these things and we combine them to kind of get a composite thing because each one is kind of different for different ways, for different, the different ways that things can go wrong. Um, so then, that, the idea there is you basically take two strings or two fields and you turn them into a score, like of how similar they are, uh, a flow between zero and one conceptually. And then, but you could do that with multiple uh, records. You can do that names, you can do that addresses, city, 
whatever you can whatever you can think about. And then you're like, well, how do I decide which which one matters more? Um, this part is actually pretty simple. This is kind of like a problem that statistics is really good for. Um, and so we just uh, use we get the user to uh, to label a bunch of examples of like are these records the same or not, and we use that to learn uh, basically a regularized logistic regression uh, set of weightings that you know ideally should be the best way to weight those different types of similarities. Um, so this is the interface that we have actually in um, a software as a service called ddupe.io that lives above um, our open source library, but the open source library um, provides interfaces and there's a built-in kind of command line thing too that says like, here's this record, here's that record, are they the same or not? So, here's, so this one is the kind of choices that you have to make where you same name, you know, different, like maybe the same company, uh, pretty different addresses. Um, the really hard problem for this is actually getting it to scale. Um, if you compare each pair, of, a possible pair of records, it grows basically with the square of the size of the data set. So if you have a thousand records, you can probably do it. Um, it makes four million comparisons, but if you have a million records, you're talking about 500 billion records and you would have a really, if you, you have a really nice laptop, you're still not going to be able to do that. So um, the way that we do this is that you do something called blocking, where you say like, well, what's a set of records? What's something that a set of records that really are uh, co-reverent? What are they going to share something in common? So maybe they share the first three characters of the name field. And so you make these blocks of records that have share some common attribute and you can have millions and millions of these blocks, but each of these blocks is pretty small. And so the squared problem, you have a bunch of, of squared problems, but, the, but you're, what you're squaring is small. So you're squaring three, and then squaring two, and you're adding those up. And so it, it can kind of, if things are going well, it will grow um, uh, kind of somewhat linearly, but um, it can still explode. So the finding good rules for the particular data set is hard. Uh, and it's really the kind of key to actually getting to scale. So we use a branch and bound algorithm to try to find the best blogging rules for a particular set of data and a bunch of other kind of complicated stuff. And this is actually where most of the challenge and interesting methods in this library are coming from. So 2012, we presented a little prototype of this work. We could handle 10,000 records. Um, now we can handle 60 million records. We had made 37 commits um, as of a couple hours ago. We had uh, 2,500 commits. And this work has been used in at least 20 academic papers. Um, it's been used in hundreds of other people's projects that have been published on GitHub and many more that have not. Um, there's been three open source products built on top of it to make it easier to use. Uh, we built the first one and two other people have built the other two. And we um, have built a uh, software as a service. So we really did, we started down this road because we really wanted to, we really wanted to help people figure out how, like campaign finance or like figure, like do these like basic research tasks. Um, and it was just a stupid problem to get in the way. Uh, and so we're like, well, great, we'll make an open source Python library and then we'll solve the problem. And like the technology is really very good and there's not actually a lot of Python programmers in the world relative to the number of people who have this problem. So uh, a few years ago we started uh, building a software as a service to try to get more people to actually be able to take advantage of this technology called vdoop.io. Um, and it's basically a uh, it guides people through a workflow you know, without having to be able to be a Python programmer. And uh, it works really well. It's used by, um, it's been used by hundreds of people. Um, even more than that, it's used by a bunch of people who paid for it. We've had enterprise customers. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's awesome. Check it out. Tell your company about it. Um, if you want to, uh, if any of this problem is interesting to you, or if you have this problem, you 
use dedupe, I'll have a link about how to get started with that in a second. If uh, it's an open source project, so um, some particular things that we could use help with uh, in the open source project is uh, when we started down this road, the data science ecosystem was a lot thinner uh, and kind of just getting started. It was really not clear that Python was going to be the winner uh, as the as a as the as the language where kind of data science would live, uh, and um, there are our own, own secrecies. We don't actually use pandas very much in our data work, uh, so that's kind of, but that's kind of a missed opportunity because a lot of people who do have this problem use pandas, and so that bridge is a little, could be tighter. That'd be great to have a wrapper of Tdupe that was more friendly for panda people. Um, right now, we provide um, binary wheels for about 20 different flavors of operating systems. Um, so it's really easy to install those, but there's a lot of, uh, Conda is awesome, but it also means like a whole other set of package managers that you also need to, as a publisher, you also like need to think about. And I haven't thought about it because we don't use Conda, but if, um, I know there's a problem. This would be great to have some help with. Documentation is always good. Um, we have a, a really probably one of the most useful Piece of documentation we have is we just have a repo of examples of how to use you do. If you could contribute some examples there, that'd be awesome. And this is probably the best entry point into the library is uh, docs.dedupe.io. There's links there to the repo and everything else that you need to get started. And then dedupe.io is a software as a service that many companies and organizations would find helpful. Um, this is me. Um, that's my name, that's my email address, and that's my Twitter handle. Um, come talk to me after the presentation. Oh, oh yeah, I can take some questions. So you're looking for contributors. Uh, are there first time issue tags? Um, yeah, so I think that uh, there are not first time issue tags. Um, uh, some of the things around uh, using some, uh, writing some better examples would probably be a great place to start. And then I do think that some of the things that are really about translating, um, translating, uh, building some wrappers around uh, the library so that uh, it was easier for folks to use uh, within the Pandas ecosystem, I think would also um, could be a, a lighter load without having to no, you, you need to know some things about like programming generally, but you don't even know a lot about machine learning in order to do that. But to do, to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? So I've been using fuzzy wuzzy to do the fuzzy matching. What's the one advantage of your package over fuzzy wuzzy? Repeat the question. So fuzzy. The question is, uh, you were using fuzzy wuzzy to do fuzzy matching. What's why would you use something? Why would you use to do? So I would say that there are three reasons. I mean, so one is that um, you, I mean, you won't be able to scale to large data uh, because no matter, no matter what you're using as your basis of comparison, eventually, if you're not doing blocking, then you're gonna uh, you're gonna run into comparisons you just can't handle. Two. Um, uh, you almost will always do better if you can't if you have it to use more than one attribute of your data to try to figure out whether the records are co-referent. And fuzzy wuzzy doesn't help you do that at all. It just compares, uh, uh, just gives you a score for a single one. So it kind of like does just the very first step of the one, two, three. Um, so if you do, you get the two and the three. Uh, Yeah. Well, you need to pick a threshold with ours too. I mean, but it's kind of an easier threshold to think about because it's a probability between zero and one whether a pair of records is a match or not. And there is no kind of way to reason about the threshold like with a raw string distance. Uh, so can, can you talk a little bit about the size of the data set that is, um, or how that impacts, right? Like you said, some of these, these techniques work really well if you have, you know, maybe a billion documents and there's no spellings, right? 
But if you have just, say, 30 documents and you want to do something that's on the small side, right? So like, how does the size of the data set fit into what you're trying to do? Um, I mean, I, so yeah, so the question is like, when would you use, when would you use different techniques for cleaning up your data, doing finding duplicates in your data, depending upon the and size of the data? I, I guess I'm more interested in, in, in like the small size of things, right? Because there's a lot of people who have this problem, but their data set isn't particularly large, right? So maybe some sophisticated techniques don't, are harder to apply because they don't have a lot of training data. Um, the, yeah, so, so to, to point of training data, uh, the system performs pretty well with 20 positive and 20 negative examples. Um, so you don't need a lot of training data. I mean, it does better with more, but that's, that's generally what I use. Um, so you can get that. Um, the thing is, is, is that uh, small data is kind of relative, right? So the thing is, is that if there's a thousand records, that's a million possible. Um, it's like, you know, it's like a, yes, yeah, 500,000 comparisons, possible comparisons, and so that's way more than a person can do. Um, I think it's, um, for me, I think it's less about the kind of, I think there's a feeling that people have, that programmers have, who are not familiar with um, machine learning techniques, that the rule-based approaches are something that is kind of more human scale. You know, it's like, I understand what I did to make this match happen. And I think that's a real feeling. And I think there's some, and I think actually a real point. And I think it's, um, I think it's kind of like a, uh, there's a, there's a, William Penn was um, the governor of Pennsylvania. And he was a Quaker. Quakers are uh, pacifists. And, um, uh, he was born at a time, uh, he was like a contemporary of the founder of Quakerism, which is called George Fox. And it was also, he was a, William Penn was also an aristocrat, and aristocrats at that time wore swords, just as a matter of their dress. And uh, William Penn felt really um, ambivalent about carrying the sword. And he asked George Fox what he should do, and George Fox said, wear it as long as you can. And I think that's the answer, it's like if you can do rules, and you're comfortable with that, do it as long as you can, and eventually you'll get to a size of data where you can't do it anymore. And that can often be 10,000 records. Yeah, have most of your use cases been applied to English language tests? Most of them have, but we have, okay, so the question was, have most of our use cases been English? I think the question, the implicit question is like, how would this do in other languages? I think this would do well um, in, um, uh, writing systems that were that were phonetic, uh, or broadly phonetic. So I think it would do well with like um, Arabic, and uh, it has an okay with Arabic. I mean, it's like does better for English, but it does pretty well for all the European languages. It does fine. With, it does okay with Arabic. It probably would not do well with an ideographic writing system. Um, I think there are ideas about how to do that, but we just haven't worked through them. Sure. Um, so the first question is yes. So we have um, a number of we have a, uh, about, uh, we have a we have a, about uh, ten to fifteen built-in types of comparisons. So doing a string comparison or an exact comparison or a categorical comparison, or if you're doing numeric comparisons, so you can tell you can tell the do how you want to compare things. Uh, second. Um, you can um, by inspecting the weights of the logistic regression. Um, it's not like the, it's not a very common use, it's not a common thing that people ask to do, so we haven't made that super easy, but um, it, under the hood it's just regularized logistic regression, so you could inspect the weights to kind of get a feel for which, uh, which variables end up being important. 
right, one last question. Last question, and then we'll head out. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So, um, so we kind of have, so the user provides training data through an active learning loop. Um, so some, but let's just put that aside, there's some way that the user provides a list of labeled examples, pairs of records that are true duplicates and pairs of records that are distinct. Um, uh, then we try, then the, the program tries to learn the set of blocking rules that best cover, like they cover all of the true duplicates while producing the minimum number of total comparisons. Um, so the main way that you control, the, control which block rules get decided is by increasing the, the amount of training that you might add. But there are some toggles, there are some dials there, so you can adjust the um, amount of uh, recall and precision that you kind of would be willing to accept in, a, in the blocking rules. So you can choose to have blocking rules that are um, kind of more broader and admits more comparisons that are not actually going to lead to um, uh, true matches. Thank you. Yes. Yeah.